The Tom Woods Show, episode 1988. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, for all you libertarians stuck in the miserable dating scene, I have just the thing for you. Drome is a free new values-based dating app. You pick deal breakers and deal makers, such as politics, religion, any other values. As soon as someone matches your deal breakers and deal makers and you match theirs, you get a notification. Sign up for free at drome.date slash woods. That's D-R-O-M dot D-A-T-E slash woods. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Murray Sabrin is back with us today. It's unbelievable. We just had Murray on to talk about his book on healthcare, and now he's got a brand new book called Navigating the Boom Bust Cycle, an Entrepreneur's Survival Guide, which is so important and fills such an important gap because, as I was saying at the end of the last episode, we're very good at explaining the theory behind the boom and bust cycle, where it comes from, why the economy has an artificial boom that has to end in a bust, and what the source of that is. But what am I, as a business owner, supposed to do with that information? That's the kind of question that Murray Sabrin is answering in this book. Now, you don't have to be a business owner to profit from this book. You will understand the Austrian theory of the business cycle a lot better if you see what its implications are for a lot of business-related questions. So Murray was a professor of finance at Ramapo College in New Jersey for 35 years. He's now retired down in Florida, as all sensible people are, and I'm delighted to have him back. Murray, great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me back after a short hiatus from our last session. Yeah, I think, actually, you've just set a record after eight years of podcasting. This was an all-time record. The shortest amount of time between interviews with the same guest where he has a new book in between the interviews. I think it's been like a month since we spoke the last time. You already have another book out. That is the shortest since an author has returned to the show with a brand new book. And on a totally different topic, we talked about healthcare last time. And that and all our other previous interviews will be linked on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1988. But this time, as I just told the folks, we're talking about your book, Navigating the Boom Bust Cycle, an Entrepreneur's Survival Guide. This fills... It's not a long book, and it's not difficult to absorb, and it's full of very good information and counsel. But I would say also that it fills a gap because on the one hand, you have people in the business world who want practical advice. On the other hand, you have theoretical Austrian economics, and we haven't really bridged that gap very well. I can think of a couple of books but there really isn't that much on it. There's a lot about the theory of the business cycle, but not a lot about now that I'm a business owner, what am I supposed to do with this information? So I assume that you noticed the same thing I did. Well, absolutely. When I put together this proposal nearly two years ago with the acquisitions editor for Business Experts Press, the focus of the publisher is to provide practical information for business decision makers so they can grow their business and avoid the pitfalls that are always out there when you're an entrepreneur, even though you you may not be in a business cycle, but we're always in a business cycle in America, as you know, since the beginning of the Republic. So I put this book together and it was fairly easy to do given what I've been doing for the past 40 some odd years and writing about Austrian economics, the business cycle, the Fed. And now how do you apply this to the business decision maker? And that's really the essence of the book. Well, start up by just saying a quick word about what the boom-bust cycle is. I mean, of course, we know where the boom-bust cycle comes from, but what exactly is it? Because sometimes people think, well, you'll have a boom-bust cycle if oil prices go up because that will hurt the economy. But that's not really what we're talking about. No, we're talking about the systematic ups and downs of the economy caused by Federal Reserve manipulation of interest rates. That, I think, is the shortest and succinct evidence that we have, given that the Fed's been around since 1913. And of course, as you know, before then, the banks were manipulating money and credit with fractional reserves and pumping money into the economy, not backed by gold or silver. So the business cycle has been with us in a very systematic fashion for more than 100 years since the Fed was created, because uh, they think it's their job to micromanage the economy. And that, I think, is the great flaw in conventional economics, that they think that there's a role for a central bank 
in order to grow the economy. And I think as the Austrian economists have pointed out from the time of Menger and Mises and Hayek and others, Rothbard, of course, is that you don't need a central bank to manipulate interest rates. Interest rates should be a market price determined by people's savings, and that will give us the opportunity for business people to take the information they have at hand and build their great businesses, which, by the way, they do in spite of all the Fed's manipulation. And that's one of the things I learned in doing this research is that the amazing resiliency of the American economy through these ups and downs and the creativity of entrepreneurs around the country from Main Street to uh, larger entrepreneurs who do incredible things despite all the rules and regulations that the monetary manipulations of the Federal Reserve. I guess the key question before we get into specifics that will bother some people involves timing. Because it's one thing to say, well, the Federal Reserve is engaging in a lot of uh, price inflation with its credit expansion and all that. But as we've seen, that can go on for quite a while, longer maybe than some of us thought, before the crash finally comes. So the result has been a lot of newsletter writers urging people to avoid doing X, Y, and Z. And by avoiding X, Y, and Z, they're also shielding themselves from all the profits they could have been making. So how do you deal with with that specific problem, that we can't really know the timing? Well, that's a great question. And that's something I try to address in, in the book very carefully, because business people know the strength and weaknesses of their sector just by everyday purchases of consumers, by supply chain issues that are going on. Those are the normal business things that happen. But then when you add on the business cycle, that's when it gets a little bit more tricky for business people, as we saw during the housing bubble. People were crazed for getting into housing, leveraging the housing that they had and buying more housing. And then the whole thing fell apart in 2007, 2008. So what I tried to do in this book is to give entrepreneurs some guidance as to what to look for from the macro perspective. And I pulled up all sorts of charts, including real GDP, money supply numbers, unemployment, the inverted yield curve, which, by the way, is the, probably the best single indicator of when the economy is going to start to roll over. And that indicator gives you, I think, six months to a year in advance that the economy will go into a recession. And that's been historically what's happened, I think, in the post-war period, is that the inverted yield curve is the best indicator that we have. And you could use it very confidently. For example, in 2019, the yield curve inverted. And so I was looking at that and saying, okay, we're going to have a recession. And then COVID hit. And then the economy fell apart because of the lockdowns. But the economy was going to roll over in 2020, even if there wasn't any COVID, because the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates and tightening credit. So what you got was the business cycle rolling over, the economy imploding because of COVID, and then the Fed stepped in with the most incredible expansion of money and credit in our history, where they increased their balance sheet by $4 trillion in literally weeks. So again, that was one example of how two factors came in, the lockdowns and the business cycle coinciding in early 2020. All right, suppose I do note this. Okay, the yield curve has inverted, and I know I have you know X amount of months before the economy goes down. How does that affect my business decision making? Does that mean I hold off on long term investment? Does that mean I don't stock up on inventory? On the other hand, it could also depend on the kind of product I sell. If I sell macaroni and cheese, right. maybe I'll sell more of that during downtimes because people are buying cheap food. How do I take the information that you're giving me in the financial press about the yield curve and translate it into business decisions? Well, again, that's the essence of what this advice is all about. You have to know what sector you're in and how that sector historically has been sensitive to the business cycle. So we know from Austrian theory that the capital goods sector is the most sensitive, and that will have the greatest decline during the downturn of the economy. So what you would do, I guess, as an entrepreneur, is that you would see very carefully what your flow order is and build up liquidity. In other words, raise as much cash as possible, because one thing you want to do during a downturn, if you're in a strong financial position, is to buy up assets of competitors that may go bankrupt. You may be able to buy up assets at 10, 20 cents on the dollar and make a ton of money during the next upswing in the business cycle. Well, how about, you have a section in here on small business in particular. Why would that make a difference, the size of the business with regard to how they deal with uh, the business cycle? 
Well, as you know, small businesses tend to uh, work on very thin margins and they may not have a lot of liquidity. So if you have an economic downturn that may affect a business in a town that's very sensitive to the business cycle, Remember years ago, Pittsburgh was a steel town and they were very sensitive to the business cycle. They're no longer a steel town. They're a diversified, thriving economy. But if you're in a small community, 100, 200,000, 300,000 people, that there's a major employer that's making capital goods and they have a downturn, your small business on Main Street, whether it's a diner, whether it may be a pharmacy, maybe a clothing store, maybe feel the brunt of the downturn because of the uh, capital goods company in your area getting really smacked by the recession. We've been hearing a lot in the news about supply chain issues that are not because of cyclical problems, really, but because of the lingering effects and sometimes ongoing effects of lockdowns around the world. But we didn't know exactly what the economic consequences of that would be, but we knew it would be something somewhat new under the sun. It's not quite the same thing as a cyclical issue because it's entirely, I mean, I, I know what causes a business cycle. And simply saying people can't go to work or you can't operate at full capacity, that's a very different phenomenon. So already we have supply chain problems that need to be addressed. But even supposing, again, let's stipulate for the sake of argument so as to generalize what you're saying as broadly as possible. Let's say that there is no COVID. It's just normal times. And a business cycle is now about to go from boom to bust. What does that mean for supply chain issues. Uh, What should I be watching out for as a business person somewhere along that chain? Yeah, the supply chain really, I don't think, has been disrupted in previous cycles. Uh, From the research I did, people were able to get uh, raw materials. They were able to get intermediate products uh, during the downturn without a problem. I think what we're seeing right now is a new phenomenon of uh, government intervention from the regulatory end with lockdowns and COVID restrictions and vaccine uh, mandates and so on and so forth, and the ebbs and flows of the business cycle. So you really have to unpack this, Tom, in order to look at the data and see exactly what business people are saying about supplies. We know that there is a computer chip shortage. That's why some of the auto dealers are having a tough time. In fact, I just read something the other day that some of the car companies are raising prices and putting some sort of an adjustment fee on their MSRP sticker that they put on the car because of all the supply chain disruptions. So again, we had supply chain disruptions, as you know, during the two oil crises of the 1970s and early 80s. But those were just very specific to oil, but they didn't affect the general public that much, except you had to wait in line for the gasoline. But otherwise, if you go to the store today, uh, you go to the big box stores, the shelves seem to be pretty much stocked. Uh, You can go to small business stores in your community, and they look like they have uh, enough goods to meet consumer demand. So again, it's in the manufacturing sector we're seeing the problem. And if it persists, that's when you'll see the shortages show up uh, at the retail end. But right now, I think we're in pretty good shape. And of course, manufacturers not being stupid realize that supply and demand works. So when there's a supply shortage, they have the opportunity to raise prices. And with people flush with cash because of the Federal Reserve's easy money policy for the last two years, people are willing to pay, it seems, for the higher prices. And that's why we're seeing the inflation rate jump so much this year. Well, in your chapter on managing the supply chain, you say, for example, the bottom line for managing raw materials and the supply chain is is to be flexible and nimble, especially as the business cycle unfolds over time. So there's something about the ordinary business cycle that means that the entrepreneur has to be especially alert to it for this type of reason. So what exactly is he supposed to be doing? Well, this is really, I think last uh, a few months ago, we saw the lumber prices skyrocket. I mean, the, earlier this year, that they've come down quite a bit. So if you're a builder and you see that lumber prices are starting to rise, may you may go into the futures market and and buy a few contracts to lock in a price for lumber. So this way uh, you're not stuck with having rising prices for lumber and then trying to pass that on to consumers because we know consumers can be very what halting when it comes to rising prices. Whether you're a copper miner or a gold miner or a silver miner or anything regarding raw materials, you've got to be very careful as to where prices are going and how you want to protect yourself because it may be difficult in some sectors to raise prices because your costs have gone up. And that's where it becomes more entrepreneurial than theoretical is to see exactly when you think that demand will be strong enough that you can pass on higher prices to to your uh, consumers. All right. I'm with you on all this. I think this is all great. 
And there's, by the way, there's a lot of detail in your book, very specific advice, charts and graphs galore. As I say, it's not a super long book. You can absorb it without spending an inordinate amount of time, but it would be very, very much worth your while to read it. So, you know, a chapter I probably wouldn't have thought of, I wouldn't have thought of half of this, even the subject, the chapter headings, much less the content in them, but in particular, mergers and expansion, things of that nature, even these types of questions, the proper resolution of them can also be distorted by an artificial boom, because maybe it may look like the thing for me to do is to merge with this other firm, because of conditions that actually are peculiar only to boom conditions, artificial boom conditions, that if we had a normal economy that wasn't being ginned up by artificial credit, maybe this merger wouldn't make sense. So that's a tricky thing to navigate too. How does knowledge of the business cycle help us? uh, I mean, how do we navigate that kind of question? Yeah, I think we've seen some of these mergers really turn to bust because uh, Companies overpaid for what was considered trophy assets. And this is the tricky thing about, about entrepreneurs. Remember, entrepreneurs by nature are very optimistic about the future. So they will look at a company and say, hey, I've got to have this company because I think there's great synergy between my company and, and that company. And they'll they'll pay a premium in if it's a publicly held company, they may pay a 50%, 100% premium for a company because they think that company in the future will, will generate enough revenue to justify the price that they're paying today. And sometimes these things fall apart pretty quickly when there aren't the synergies. And I give some examples in the book about mergers that really went bust. But uh, this is why entrepreneurship is not something you can learn by reading a book. You really have to go out and do it. And some of the great entrepreneurs, as you know, Tom, started very early in life. Yeah. Um, I, I guess one of the best examples would be, even though he doesn't, he didn't create anything, but the great investor Warren Buffett started investing when he was 11 years old. And he learned a lot of lessons as a youngster and then studied under Benjamin Graham at Columbia University for his MBA and learned the essence of, of business and how to value things and he's been quite successful, taking Berkshire Hathaway from an eleven million dollar company to, I think, what six hundred billion dollars today. An extraordinary run over uh, fifty five, fifty six years. This is a bit of a tangent, Murray, but I don't know if you've ever seen the letter that Warren's father, Howard Buffett, the congressman from Nebraska, wrote to Murray Rothbard. Yes. He wrote a letter saying, you know, how much he's enjoying, although he's, you know, not getting through the whole thing, but man, economy, and state. And I've heard that you have a book on the panic of 1819, and I have a son who's interested in the history of economic cycles, and maybe I could get a copy of that. And you just think, oh my gosh, we came so close, right? <laughs> you know, you had Howard Buffett as your father. You're interested in these sorts of questions. He's talking to Murray Rothbard. Didn't quite work out, but he is still a great investor. There's no question about that. I think Buffett's success is really absorbing the insights of the Austrian school because one of the major insights I think of the Austrian school is that over the long term, which I don't think anyone has explicitly stated this, over the long term, stock prices will do quite well. And I have a chart of the S&P 500, and there are long-term secular bull markets and and long-term secular bear markets. But over the long term, Buffett has proven if you invest in quality companies over the long term, you are going to do extremely well. This is something I discuss with my students in my financial history class, securities and investments class, that if you have a 50-year time horizon, you could become very wealthy if you save 10, 15% of your income and buy quality companies over that time period. All right, Libertarians, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, which is a sponsor a great many of you are going to want to use and have been waiting for, and that is Drome, a free new values-based dating app. Now, dating apps are terrible. Everybody knows that. You got the face swiping apps, you got the quote unquote expert matching apps, and both usually waste your time. Well, the solution is values based matching. In this day and age, if you're libertarian, you might want to find a libertarian mate. I'm not saying it's impossible to date a non libertarian, but my gosh, you're going to be interrogated about this and that. And I know people might change to meet you where you are, but why not just find the perfect match off the bat? Well, Drome is a free new values-based dating app where you pick deal breakers and deal makers. There are no experts and match percentages. You don't have to addictively check the app. As soon as somebody matches your deal breakers and deal makers and you match them, you get a notification. If you don't find a deal breaker or deal maker that's important to you, you can add your own anonymously. Drome is also video only for more human interactions. So go to drome, that's D-R-O-M, dot date, 
slash woods in your phone browser. Click the iOS or Google button to install and use the invite code woods to sign up. That's drome, D-R-O-M dot D-A-T-E slash woods. Drome, design and meet your perfect match. It's free to use. Let's go back for a minute just to the general subject of cycles because you have a chapter in here about whether history repeats itself and can we learn from past cycles. Now, of course, each cycle looks somewhat different. Not every cycle has a housing bust, for example. There tends to be some kind of a big thing. I think it was uh, Roger Garrison who said that whatever the big thing is at the time, the boom tends to make bigger and sort of outsized and deformed in some way. So it could be, you know, it could be computers, it could be whatever. So with each cycle, the particulars of it and the sectors that are highlighted in it may be different. But there must be enough commonalities in these cycles that we can nevertheless draw conclusions about them for the present day. So in treating this subject, what did you come up with in looking at that question? Well, as I go around talking about my book, we're in everything bubble 2.0. The everything bubble, which I think, I don't know, David Stockman may have coined that term or somebody else, is that we've had a nice big boom from the bottom of the housing bust in 2009, where stocks went up, bonds went up, real estate went up. That came to a halt when we had the COVID lockdown and the economy imploded and the stock market imploded. And now we're on another run starting in March of 2020. And this is everything bubble 2.0. I mean, housing prices, as you know, Tom, especially here in Florida, have gone through the roof. I mean, it's unbelievable how housing prices have skyrocketed in Florida and other states around the country. So we got that. We have uh, stock prices, of course, have gone up enormously since 2009 and since the uh, March 2020 low. And of course, Hunter Biden's paintings, there's a bubble there, right? 500,000 for a Hunter Biden painting. So we that could be the indicator for this boom is the Hunter Biden uh, painting indicator. We know that not only real estate, we're seeing uh, bonds, stocks. Those are the three main major sectors of the economy, the financial markets and the commercial markets. And our rents are starting to go up as well. So we're seeing everything going up in price. The good news is that there are things that are still going down in price because of the tremendous productivity in those sectors. What do you say to people who would complain about some, let's say, Austrian investment advisors who are just accused constantly of, of being perma bears? You know, they, people say... Uh, of course you guys get the downturns right because you're always saying there's going to be a downturn. So naturally, you're going to occasionally get one right. So Mark Skousen, for example, I'm sure you know him, sure. has been critical of some of these people. And he says, you're missing out on huge profits because you're constantly saying everything's going to go down. What's your take on that? Well, this is what I think one of the most important individuals who unfortunately is no longer with us is Bob Wenzel, the late Bob Wenzel, really applied Austrian economics to financial market analysis. And he was, I think, on top of things in 2008, he called the uh, bubble bursting and the downturn. And he was right on the last year. He was warning that the inflation rate was going to go to 5% and possibly 10% later this year. So we have a few months left to 2021, and we'll see what happens to the inflation rate by the end of this year. So Bob was one of those unique individuals that took Austrian economic insights and said, let's apply that to how the ebbs and flows of the financial markets. And he was probably the best analyst out there of all the ones who claim to be Austrian-oriented financial advisors. He was, I think, the one that really had his a great pulse on the markets, and that uh, you've got to go with the ebbs and flows of the markets. And we know there are cycles. And so you just follow the cycles as much as you can. And it's very hard to predict, as uh, as I think I mentioned to you uh, last time, prediction is hard, especially about the future. And it's very hard to time these things. But uh, like I said, for me, when I was doing this research, the inverted yield curve really stuck out as the major, major indicator for when the economy is going to roll over. When Everything started to go crazy in March, April 2020. And we saw all these lockdowns and restrictions on business. And nobody really knew what the metric was for when whatever normal is would be allowed to come back. And I thought that this would mean that entrepreneurship would just go in the tank. Because who would want to start a business under such uncertain conditions? But yet, I was wrong, apparently. Now, some people may say, well, that's because they were special government programs helping people at the time, and they were taking advantage of that. Maybe, but were you surprised by that? I, I just thought nobody would want to take risks in an environment in which 
government arbitrariness is worse than ever. Well, here's, I think, what happens. Some very astute people realize that people are staying at home. So what do they need at home? They may need delivery service. They may need in-home advice, whether it's uh, a physical training or something like that. And people started to figure out, what do people need? There are always needs and wants out there, Tom. So astute entrepreneurs figured out what are people's needs. We, we saw e-commerce explode. We saw delivery services explode. We saw uh, telemedicine explode. So when you go down the list of all the things that did well during the lockdowns, you see the ingenuity of American people, of entrepreneurs, especially young people who realized, hey, there's an opportunity here for me to provide some service that I could make some a decent living without having to leave my house or maybe going to someone's house and helping them out with whatever. And it seemed to be extremely <laughs> gratifying for people to do that. In addition, what I discovered is that a lot of companies retooled. There are companies that retooled their businesses because their current business was not uh, able to function during the lockdowns. One furniture company I came across, they were strictly a showroom operation. So they went online and started to increase their sales dramatically. So again, I don't think we would have seen the economy bounce back as quickly if it wasn't for the internet, because there's no way we could work at home without the internet. And so I think uh, that weighed on the mind of a lot of the policymakers who said, hey, we can have a shutdown. People can work at home and there'll be no problem. But the point is, um, if we didn't have the internet. So in a way, the internet bailed out the autocratic uh, bureaucrats and politicians that locked us down. Yeah, but you know, I wonder if we could go the other side of that and say, if there hadn't been an internet, would they have been as likely to do the lockdowns in the first place? Because there wouldn't have been an escape hatch and the catastrophe of the lockdowns would have been far more severe and readily apparent. So maybe the internet, which helps us out in so many cases, was actually there was a moral hazard involved with it or something. Oh, there's no question about it. I spoke to people about this. There's no way the economy could have rebounded without the internet because there's no way you could work at home. Yeah, so that's why I think maybe they might not have done as many lockdowns. You couldn't have done school at home. You couldn't have worked oh, at home. Absolutely. So we yeah, would have just lived. Absolutely. So this is why technology is a double-edged sword. On yeah. the one hand, it, it gives us a tremendous opportunities. On the other hand, it gives the political class the ability to lock us down and to do very terrible things to us. I want to recommend your book, by the way, not just for business people, but also for the many people who listen to this program who are interested in economics. Because as I say, in Austrian economics in particular, this is filling a gap because it takes that theoretical knowledge you have and it shows you the real world ways in which it can inform decision making about your workforce and you know, about expansion or otherwise, and all these sorts of economic decisions that are made all the time, well, they're made within the context of a federal reserve system that is intervening in the economy and in some cases fueling substantial booms that are going to unravel. So these decisions that are made are not being made by business people in a vacuum. They're being made not in some theoretical world where there's no Fed, but in the real world in which there is a Fed. And you're showing what kind of sound decision-making you can make if you have the economic knowledge the Austrian school provides. And I, I don't think there are, as I say, there might be a handful of titles that touch on this, but not a lot. And so I think you're, you're filling an important gap. What would be your, your final word before we wrap up for today? Well, again, I'm a very optimistic person uh, like Murray Rothbard was. And uh, I think we have a great opportunity to expand people's understanding of the economy and let entrepreneurs do what they do best, which is to provide us with the goods and services. And uh, I'm really excited about this book because it, this is my first business book where I, it's really geared to the business community and to business professors to teach their students about the cycle and how business decision making could be made better during the course of a cycle. So that's what I'm really excited about. And for uh, the publisher, they're offering a 20% discount on the book, which is really fabulous because uh, anytime you get a discount, Tom, that goes right into my savings account. So, so for anyone who wants to uh, get the book, the publisher is offering a 20% discount on, on the website. Okay, well, I'll get that link from you and I'll put it at tomwoods.com slash 1988 so people can take advantage of that. So if you are interested in the book, you can just go and type navigating the boom-bust cycle somewhere 
but you can also go to tomwoods.com slash 1988 and the link will just be waiting for you. And the book, once again, is Navigating the Boom Bust Cycle, an Entrepreneur's Survival Guide by our guest today, Murray Sabrin. Murray, thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you a couple of weeks from now at the Supporter Summit of the Mises Institute. I assume you're still going to be there? I'm looking forward to that because this is a great opportunity because uh, this month, Tom, is the 40th anniversary of my doctoral dissertation. Ah, uh, well, how about that? Okay, well, something to celebrate, no doubt. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Always great being with you. Thank you, Murray. All right, folks, that's going to do it. If you like and appreciate what goes on at the Tom Woods Show, please consider becoming a supporting listener. You get many, many benefits, not least of which is membership inside what I call the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is our great group of really intelligent folks in an uncensored setting where you can actually talk about sensible, interesting things without being fact-checked by idiots. So check that out at supportinglisteners.com. You know you belong in there. You know that little voice in there. This is one of those times you got to listen to that voice. Head over to supportinglisteners.com. I thank you in advance, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.